Hey everybody and welcome back to the Off the Key Podcast. I'm your host Mac and today I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts, Garrett Tendo Lemons and James. Hello, hello. And today for the fifth entry of our Off the Key Central series, we're going to be talking about James's first pick, Led Zeppelin 2. So James, tell me, why'd you pick Led Zeppelin 2 over 4? Or any other Zeppelin album, you mean? <laughs> I know, I'm just, I'm joking. <laughs> so there's like four different Zeppelin albums you can choose as an essential listen. But two, to me, I think is, it's their first essential. Their debut album, one, I love a lot. It's good, but I feel like you can skip that one. Well, arguably, you could make an argument for it. I would argue otherwise, but it's very loose. It's not very tight. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's before it, they acquired their like album oriented like yeah, rock album, and it gives more format. They, I will say that album gives more to the credence of them borrowing other people's stuff. I mean, they had more of their own solid, unique ideas. One feels like they're kind of doing a little bit of taking some blues standards, which is completely okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But two had more of a unique feel. Yeah, well, they do that on two as well, but not quite as much as one. Two, I think, is where their sound kind of coalesced. Their unique sound started to really appear on two, and it's just a foundational record for rock, hard rock, and even metal. If you are a fan of rock or if you are a rock musician, you have to listen to this album. If you haven't already. Yeah, I have to agree. I think 2 is their heaviest album by far. Easily. No questions about it. It's pretty crazy how forward-thinking Led Zeppelin was for the time they came out. I mean, they were they started in, what, the 60s? Yeah, 69. Yeah, 69. Uh, they formed in 68. But the sound that Led Zeppelin was creating at the time was virtually unheard of. They really shaped the sound of rock in for, the 70s. for the next decade. Yeah. Arguably the next two two decades and beyond. Yeah, now, if you're wondering who Led Zeppelin is, we'll give you an overview. <laughs> Somehow. Also, bless Somehow. you. Bless your heart, bless your soul. <laughs> I'm impressed if you haven't heard of Led Zeppelin. You know how many times I've had boomer dads come up to me and be like, hey, you want to listen to some real rock music? And then they talk about Zeppelin. Or just me. Or just James. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Mac, you want to listen to some, some real rock music? <laughs> hey, you want to sit around the barbecue and talk about some Zeppelin? <laughs> it, and it's it's kind of unfortunate that it's gotten reduced to that the, now. But <laughs> <laughs> Jokes aside, that like Zeppelin is a very important band to the history of rock music. Music in general. And music in general. So, if you were wondering, Led Zeppelin were an English rock band formed in 1968 by Robert Plant on vocals, Jimmy Page on guitar, John Paul Jones, on bass and keyboards, and John Bonham on drums. They are cited as a historically significant band for being one of the progenitors of hard rock and heavy metal. Although they drew their style from mainly blues and folk music, especially blues in the early days. I mean, it's all over their first two albums. I mean, it's all really all over their entire discography. But I, th- I think you can see it strongest, though, in, yeah. in one and two. True. Originally, they were named the New Yardbirds, and Led Zeppelin landed a deal with Atlantic Records that gave them considerable artistic freedom. Additionally, the band was credited with significantly impacting the nature of the music industry with their album-oriented approach to rock music, as well as their contribution to the development of stadium rock. That was another big thing that Led Zeppelin kind of ushered in, was taking a more album-oriented approach to rock music in the sense of, this is a whole listening experience it's not like back in the early days albums were more just song compilations than they were whole artistic pieces and i feel like zeppelin was one of the first bands to really take that album oriented approach it's them alongside the who and the beatles or even like sabbath yeah and eventually the stones would be that way as well well the stones are already kind of getting there too so zeppelin was just one of many, really. Yeah. But they were probably the ones that helped to popularize it, for sure. Yeah, I'm not saying they were the... The first the ever. The first ever. Yeah. But they, they were definitely, like, early on that train. 
Over their decade-long career, the group became one of the best-selling rock acts in the history of music. They earned five RIAA Diamond certifications for their albums, and it's estimated that the band sold anywhere from 200 to 300 million records globally to this day. Absurd. There aren't many bands that can say that. Think about it. You go to any record shop, any, like, second-hand shop, there's probably going to be a fucking Zeppelin CD or record in there somewhere. There's guaranteed to be. It, it's <laughs> it, it's going to be there. Go to that old second-hand shop, go through the record section, I guarantee you, you'll find a copy of a Zeppelin album. Oh, yeah. you can go to Barnes & Noble and you'll find... Zeppelin records there. They had Led Zeppelin 1 on vinyl in Walmart. Their influence is global. It's widespread. If you haven't heard of Led Zeppelin at this point, I am genuinely blown away. But yes, they were unquestionably one of the most influential bands of the 1970s and one of the most enduring rock groups in the history of the genre. People will not shut up about Led Zeppelin still to this day. And it's understandable why. You know, I, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. They deserve the praise and the all the critical acclaim that they've gotten over the years, even as someone who is less partial to classic rock, you can't deny the group's talent, forward-thinking mindset, and undeniably great albums. The craziest thing is that they lasted only barely over 10 years. It's, it was like 11 years or 12 years. It was uh, 12, 12 years. They, they stopped in 80. Yeah. Yeah, they formed in 68, but they didn't really put out their first record until 69, their first full studio album, at least. Yeah, and it's unfortunately because of the untimely death of their drummer, John Bottom. Yes, 1980. It was a drinking legend. I mean, how, how many tequila shots did he have on the night of his death? More than 50. It was a, it was a ridiculous amount of alcohol he consumed. Literally a quarter of the amount of the alcohol he drank on the night of his death would have killed me. And he quadrupled that crazy crazy story rest in peace to one of the greatest rock drummers of all time yeah well he died too soon indeed we'll get into bottom a little later but he's a legend but yeah so we're gonna fast forward a little bit they released zeppelin one in 69 by the time zeppelin two was released the group had achieved significant commercial success with the album so they went 12 times riaa platinum mm -hmm. for led zeppelin two and it is one of the highest selling records of all time. This record knocked Abbey fucking road off of number one. Suck it, Beatles fans. <laughs> Both classics. Yes. Don't get me wrong. Like that's what I'm saying. That Abbey Road is considered one of the greatest albums of all time. It's in a lot of people's top tens or top twenty lists. And yeah. Zeppelin two knocked it off at number one. Really was a phenomenon. I mean and it's interesting because at the time, a lot of critics did not like Zeppelin. They're wrong. They were horribly wrong, but it's really funny to go back and like watch people review the first Zeppelin album and talk yeah. about how they like hate the sound and <laughs> it's too and, loud and abrasive. Yeah, that, that's something that's not often known. It's not general knowledge that at the time of the, those first two albums, Led Zeppelin was facing a lot of critical backlash. Oh, but, a lot of controversy. Yeah, but the people they fucking loved them two bands in particular come to mind when it comes to the thing like what are you smoking them and black sabbath i don't know how you can listen to their first few albums and don't think that these are at least decent or good like i don't know how you can listen to those albums and think that they're bad unless you just hate rock completely and you write it all off i don't know how you're a critic and you're just like well i mean this isn't worth it like are you are you stupid i mean you got to think about <laughs> what was coming around in the 60s that was like the ushering in of like the boy band era you know, with like Beatles and the Rolling Stones. You want to catch some heat for that one. They man. started as one. <laughs> that's that's undeniable that they started as one. Yeah, they started as a boy band. Well, uh, yeah, like the early 60s, That's that was the thing. That was yeah. big. You know, you also had like blues rock. The Stones were actually the ones that brought blues rock into the scene. Into like the pop and mainstream. Generally, generally speaking, you know, anytime trailblazers, innovators come through, usually there is going to be some pushback. So... You know, when you introduce new sounds, like I think a good example of a, the development of post rock or or even hip hop. Critically speaking, people hated hip hop when it first came to be. Oh yeah, yeah. When, whenever you introduce something new and experimental and or just different, forward yeah, thinking, people are going to resist it. So Zeppelin two here, when it came out, all right, let's let's go back a little bit. 
the 60s were kind of a bad decade for the blues, like the pure roots blues. It had kind of fallen out of popularity for a while, namely because of the pop acts and the soul and stuff that was coming out. The The popular music was, like you guys are saying, the boy bands, the, the hits music, the... Easy listening. Easy listening, yeah. yeah. The blues, while it had been popular in the 40s and... Well, maybe not popular, but it was more successful in the 50s and early 60s. The mid mid to late 60s saw a drop off in that, but it was these bands, it was these big rock bands, the English rock bands that had brought the blues back to America in a sense because they were so heavily influenced by it and they loved it so much. I mean, Zeppelin 1 and 2, they both have so many songs that are Almost direct covers of blues classics. I mean, Led Zeppelin too. It's got three three interpretations of blue songs on it. Yeah, uh, Willie Dixon and Howlin' Wolf. Whole lot of love. That is that's Willie Dixon song. That's a that's a certified blues standard, man. Oh yeah, Lemon Song is is a rearrangement of a Howlin' Wolf song, Killing Floor. Killing Floor. Excellent, excellent song. Which I'm gonna get you guys to listen to some Howlin' Wolf later. Although, <laughs> as a Howlin' Wolf fan. I definitely like Lemon Song better than the original. Not only was there, you know, the blues rock movement, but we also had, in the late 60s, the jazz fusion movement starting to erupt. Because, you know, jazz was really, it was huge in the late 50s, early 60s, even up to the mid 60s. We also saw jazz going in a more experimental direction. So there was a lot of transition and a lot of change and i think mm-hmm. the later half of the 1960s and led zeppelin was a big part of that change yeah as well as the big band movement that was that was a big thing in the late 60s as well and also in the late 60s there was the explosion of the motown and funk and that was a gigantic influence on zeppelin especially john bonham bonzo bonham is the reason i started to play drums Period. There are hundreds, probably thousands of other drummers that could, that would say the same thing. Bonham is one of the main reasons why Zeppelin sounds the way it does. He he was heavily influenced by not only big band stuff like Buddy Rich and Max Roach, Gene Krupa, but also a lot of Motown and funk, a lot of the James Brown stuff that was coming out. Bonham, a lot of the beats he played throughout Zeppelin's discography was directly inspired by guys like Bernard Purdy and Clyde Stubblefield, both of which are R&B and funk legends. And the rare thing about Led Zeppelin is that it's a band that all four or all of the members in the band had unique styles and sounds. It's not just, oh, this guy had a unique sound and the others are kind of, you know, they're good, but they're kind of, you know, doing their part. Everyone had a unique style and way of going about things. I mean, they were all freaking master musicians. Yes. Musicians. I mean, they yes. they covered a crazy range of musical styles during their you know eleven year run. Jimmy Page is probably he was probably the most professional musician at that point at the time that they started. Well, yeah, he'd been in like a million bands before. Yeah, and he was a regular session musician, session guitarist as well, and he had experience as a producer and sound engineer he'd done a lot of stuff he was undeniably a big part of zeppelin sound as well now to step back a little bit i actually think zeppelin 2 is the album where bonham shines a lot i freaking love so many of the drum parts on this album uh specifically a couple of i wanted to highlight were whole lot of love moby dick i know there's like a big camp of people who hate that song for some reason for some reason but john bonham's drum part on moby dick is Fun man. And I'll go ahead and take a little aside to defend that. So I'm a big proponent that if there is a way within the album that you could edit it to more of your tastes, you should. Like extra material that was released, you know, in that session or different versions of the song in that session, then you can. If you want to, j- there is the Moby Dick intro and outro where it just cuts the drum solo out almost entirely. Just listen to that. If, that. if the drum solo is really what kills it for you, then listen to that. That should be able to make that more to your liking, if that's like the only thing. Because I see a lot of people be like, oh, the drum solo is too long. It ruins the pace. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, listen to this version. Is that better? Okay. 
Well, I mean, I guess the argument is this is the cut they chose for Led Zeppelin 2. So this is the one they wanted to present. But oh. I like the drum solo yeah. in Moby Dick. I think it's fantastic and it's a freaking crazy way to close out the song. It's funny because if you say it's too long, I mean, the live version of this would go on for over 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Bonham would just... Basically, it was the time for the rest of the band to take a break while Bonham just went insane. <laughs> <laughs> and... Moby Dick is not Moby Dick without the drum solo. You might as well just not even have the song on there. Yeah, I love the riff. Don't get me wrong. I love it so much, but that song is about the drum solo. Well, also, all over this album, but especially in Moby Dick, and even it somehow even more so in live versions, has some of the stankiest guitar tones that I have ever seen. And not, yeah, he's trailblazing and stuff, and he was like really pushing the Les Paul to his limits, but. There are some of my like favorite guitar tones ever in this album. The Lemon Song is so dang stanky that even when people try to replicate the sound that he was using with this album, they don't really come close. Not only was it trailblazing, but also it, it's in my top 10 like guitar sounds of all time. I can honestly say the same, going back to Bonham, I can say the same about Bonham's sound. Bonham's drum sound on this album is ridiculous it is fucking massive that bass drum is absurd you can you can almost feel it thumping your chest as if you were there in front of him watching it live he's kind of an enigma that he sounds like he's playing super tight yet super loose at the same time yeah that's exactly it man and sometimes it feels like there's two drummers at certain points yeah, but it's it's just him. Just and him. That's what I'm saying. Like his sound is just so massive that it covers everything. So I got to ask you, James, what to you makes John Bonham such a special drummer? He's kind of an amalgamation of all the influences that he loved. He had that real, like you were saying, Garrett, he's super tight but also super loose at the same time. He had that sense of groove that was so apparent in a lot of the Motown drummers at the time. And he still had that blazing fast chops ability like a lot of the big band drummers did, like Buddy Rich. And he combined that all and gave steroids to it, essentially. He is often considered to be the first or one of the first heavy metal drummers. And he is, without a doubt, the most influential drummer in rock and metal history. As a drumming layman, to me, it sounds like he really gives you a buffet of the drums. I notice a lot of drummers kind of favor certain parts of their drum kit. Like Stuart Copeland, he loves the samples in like the Roto Tom, and some would love the Crash, but he really spreads the love around. It doesn't really, oh, yeah. it doesn't really seem to me like he just favors one part of his kit. He really, you know, he's really giving you the buffet of everything, but yet he's not like a you know, or jack of all trades, master of none. He's really just master of all trades. Yeah. It's not only his sense of groove and his insane chops. It's like I was saying earlier, his sound. Yeah, the way the, he recorded it. The Bonham drum sound is something that has never been replicated. Hundreds, hell, thousands of people have tried to replicate his sound, but they can't. It's just, it's so massive. It's pounding thunderous and that is yes that is (laughs) that is the reason why one of the big reasons why bonham is so influential because all these rock bands all these metal bands they wanted that massive sound for their band without having to add any percussion to it or add any layers just that on its own yeah it's not only that too it's bonham did experiment a lot i mean he added a lot of effects to his drums later in Zeppelin's career. He he added a lot of different instruments like the congas and hell he had a gong behind him a lot of times and his that influenced a lot of people. He'd have <laughs> fucking timpanis next to him. He would often use those in solos. He was a legend. Despite how fantastic Bonham is, we can't really we can't just focus on him, you know. Like, like Yes, of course. Like, <laughs> I feel like every member of this group, you know, we say this sometimes, you know, like, oh, everyone contributed, but I feel like every member of this group was a master of their craft. And not only were they masters of their craft, they understood 
how to make the music appealing. You'll hear me say, and you'll hear a lot of other people say, like, without Bonham or without Page or without John Paul Jones or Plant, Zeppelin wouldn't sound. Zeppelin would not be Zeppelin without a single one of them. Every single one. That is why when Bonham died, they stopped because they knew no one else could fill those shoes. They knew that they would not be Zeppelin anymore. They would not have the same sound. And I believe that would be true for any of the other members. Had John Paul Jones died instead of Bonham, or had Robert Plant died instead of Bonham, or Paige died, the same thing would have happened. And you can verify this because none of the music this in the solo or any of the projects they worked on after sounded anything like when they were together. Yeah, all of them just kind of moved on and started doing different things at that point. They still had their individual signature sound, but every other band they played with afterwards, it was not Zeppelin. It didn't sound like it was Robert Plant or it was Jimmy Page. And I can appreciate that they didn't try to like beat a dead horse after Bonham's death. A lot of bands will milk the tank dry. I think in Zeppelin's case, I'm glad they stopped when they did. Couldn't have been any other way. We should probably go ahead and get into the, the album <laughs> a, little, a little, A little further into the album, yes. But yeah, you know, a whole lot of love, the opener, it's fantastic. And I will notice right away, I like that this album is concise. I like that it's short, sweet, to the point. You get your blues covers, there's a nice spread of songs, and I feel like even though the sound of this album is generally the same, you get a really diverse set of tracks here. Probably the first track that really stands out, like you've got a whole lot of love. What is and what should, is what is know, and what, what should sh- never be. That's that song was a plant original. It's a little different. It has a little more of a jazzy feel to it. I kind of like that though. Yeah, I've always loved that song so much, but it still has this really heavy chorus. It's this really nice, sweet, soft and light verse, and then Page and Bonham come in with this thunderous chorus and this really, really heavy riff. It's two contrasts put together. Now, let me do the same for Paige real quick, and that James does for Bonham. What makes these songs great is the dynamics in the song, and this is because other rock songs of the time were taking a riff like Sunshine of Your Love. They come up with a riff, and it might be a good riff, or it might not be a good riff, but they take that riff and they repeat it throughout the whole thing, and that's it. There might be a little like bridge. That's it. Jimmy Page was making like songs with two or three good riffs that changed throughout the song. The songs were given great dynamics just because he was just changing things up and one of the very few that could put multiple good riffs and licks into one song and have it fit together beautifully. So the Lemon song, that's where they really get into the funk and R&B. Lemon song is one of my favorites. Even though it's, it's kind of a rearrangement of a blues song, they really make it a funk song. It's so funky. It feels like it's almost about to go out of time. Like it feels like a really old school jazz song. It feels like it's almost gonna, they're almost gonna lose it. And then it comes like right back. It's, yep. it's, a, it's a, so great that like almost like swing feel and, and but very raunchy lyrics too. Yes. If you really look into it. <laughs> oh, yes. And <laughs> to me, John Paul Jones really makes this song. It's, yes, sir. It's this song and Ramble On. Of course, JPJ, he makes Lemon Song and Ramble On are where he really stands out. His bass playing on the Lemon Song is legendary. Also like that, at certain points of this album, especially the Lemon Song, it kind of goes into like an up-tempo section that really reminds me a lot of like late 50s, early 60s rock, like a lot of like Chuck Berry, that like that section where it speeds up. Exactly. A lot of like old old school rock, and you can kind of see them do like their version before it like goes back. I I like that little that little touch that they put in. It really makes it the songs never wear out their welcome and have enough change to keep things fresh, even though they the general sound is still the same, like Max said earlier. That's them as usual, kind of wearing their influences on their sleeve and but not just not just copying their influences, they're putting it into another song of their they're kind of combining it with all the stuff that they love and making it a cohesive song now we move on to which is actually one of my least favorite tracks on this album thank you really it's not like by a wide margin same i mean if i had to pick one like if i had to pick a song it would either be thank you or 
living loving made. Th- thank you is is a sharp departure from the rest of the album. Honestly, I think it still fits. It like, still sonically. it still fits. It does, but it's like teetering on that edge. Thank you is a beautiful love ballad. Robert Plant wrote it about his wife. Not much else to say about it, really. It's J- Jimmy plays a twelve string guitar, lots of major chords, really nice and floaty. It's it really conveys the feeling of how you are when you're deeply in love. You've got those rose colored glasses on, and everything is amazing because you're so so heavily in love. It it really is like the transition point. You know, this is a well paced album, regardless. But yeah, you know, and then we get into Heartbreaker, which is a certified banger. Dear Lord, Jimmy Page, what was he what? on? This is the track where I think Jimmy Page shines 100%. In the middle, there is a guitar solo. This is the best guitar part on the album. This song probably gave birth to thousands of guitarists. It really showcases the unique style and tone of Page more than any of the other songs here. I know. Several guitarists that think that this is one of the hardest solos to play. This is a virtuoso performance from Jimmy. It's kind of funny that a lot of radio stations play the next track, Living Loving Made, and this track together, because they do kind of segue into each other very well. Well, it's, it's mainly because they're just so, so close to each other at the, at the end. At the end of Heartbreaker almost perfectly goes straight into Living Loving Made. Rhythmically, like you said, they, they just fit really well. Uh, interestingly, the band did not like the song at all. They actually never played this song live. <laughs> That's so funny to me. For yeah, some reason. they they considered it filler. <laughs> I, that's kind of how I feel about the song. <laughs> like, <laughs> it kind of is. Like like you know, I'll, I'll give thank you a pass, but this is I think the weakest song in the album. We get into the last three tracks on the album, and it starts to really pick up again. Spicy. Yeah. It's my favorite ending segment like ending album. run yeah, yeah. Like ending it's it's portion. one of my favorite ramble on of course is heavily influenced by tolkien because i feel like this is everyone's is at their peak performance at the same time you know we have plant with the great vocals and the writing incorporating just throwing like little lord of the rings mm-hmm. references in there we have page who has the riff he's got like the the soaring riff and then he's got uh, the bridge He's got the main riff in the chorus, and his guitar sounds great. I mean, the whole song is bolstered by uh, John Paul Jones' like great bass riff, and its sound. You know, he's loud, he's turned up, it anchors everything. And then you have Bonham who's playing light, and then just bam, just brings a building down when that chorus starts. Mm-hmm. I mean, it goes from just you know nothing to just crashes in, and it makes everything sound good. You just it just feels like they're all at their peak. Jones's bass line is really the driving force of the song. It's the thing that catches the ear, your ear more than anything, any other part of the song. I mean, he's so, he's so damn loud. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, even Plant's melody, which is great and lovely, and I love singing along with it, it's John Paul Jones. That is that is the central, the, the central, the fulcrum point of the song. I also like how this is kind of a taste of what's to come. This kind of folksy influence song is really an influence of what's to come in Led Zeppelin 3 and what that album is mostly going to be about from, from an instrumental standpoint. Off track a little bit. I really don't get the Zeppelin 3 hate. I don't either. I, I, don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I, it is different from their first two albums, but I think one is weaker than three by a, like a pretty large margin. Going to fly away with that one. Yes. <laughs> Another time we'll talk about three. Zeppelin is one of those bands where if you try to put their album in tier list, everyone argues about it. Yes, <laughs> there is no one is going to agree. Well, there's one of the were well, they're one of the rare bands. I mean, I can claim to have multiple potential tens in their discog. So anytime there's a band that has that, there's always going to be heavy, heavy discourse. It's just like with Beatles albums. Yeah, I mean, or everyone, like Floyd. Yeah, everyone has one. wars on, in forums about where they'd put what. Moving on from Ramble On, you have the quintessential rock drum solo, Moby Dick, with band accompaniment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the everything surrounding the drum solo is just kind of, you know, ac- it's accents. <laughs> yes, <know>? exactly. <laughs> as, 
if you're a drummer, you you know how I feel. Anyway, yes. Uh, not to discount the riff, it's kind of it's kind of a shame that that riff is accompanying the Moby Dick drum solo. Don't get me wrong, it's iconic, but god damn, that is a stanky fucking riff. <laughs> when they played that live at Royal Albert Hall, the sound that man had on his Les Paul is my favorite sound to ever come from a Les Paul guitar, ever. It was so different, and I have no idea what he was doing different, but oh my lord. Go watch that video of that. That's also, I believe, the performance where he has a the longest drum solo he's ever done on that song. We'll, but we'll link it in the video description. Yes. Of that, version. that video is spicy sounds, and give the layman a little bit of a little description of Insights. what happens during the solo besides man plays drums for the whole time. <laughs> and it's fucking amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, give us some insight, James. So Moby Dick was a regular for Zeppelin live performances. They played it at almost every single show throughout their entire career. Because, um, like I said, it, was, it kind of served as a function for let the band take a break while Bonham went crazy. But Bonham, in the beginning, most of the time, he would start with his hands. There were times where he'd start with the sticks and then move to the hands and then go back to the sticks. And I think at most of his live performances, he actually did start with the sticks. But on the recording, he starts with his hands. And that this was the first time that I had ever seen a drummer play a drum set with his hands. I remember 10, 11, 12-year-old me sitting there in, on the floor of my old house watching on my dad's uh, Led Zeppelin DVD. If you're a Zeppelin fan, you probably know which one. It's one of their first ones with the desert mesa on it. Bonham, during a lot of his solos, he used a lot of different rhythms and different things that he had picked up from a lot of the big band drummers like Buddy Rich, pretty much all of his influences. And probably the most notable of the licks that he would use in his drum solos i'd say the most famous and he did this a lot in a lot of his songs too was the bottom triplet he, it would basically like a left right kick pattern or right left kick there were some times where he would even add another hand to it like right left right kick or left right left kick he would just do that really really fast and it was just so thunderous and so loud and so insane that is definitely the lick that I got, and thousands of other drummers would copy in a lot of their solos, a lot of my solos, and a lot of fills that we would do. Again, it's a lick that he would use a lot in fills and a lot of songs like Dazed and Confused. When they're coming back in from the, like the solo section and Dazed and Confused, that's, Bonham is using that lick, that insane drum fill. Now, does he play the drums with his hands to kind of more or less show off or to, to achieve a certain sound? I think probably both. A drum solo or any solo is all about, it's about showing off. It's showing off your talent. It's showing off your ability. And it, well, it's not solely about that, but that's a big part of it. The other thing is just kind of having fun playing your instrument. But yeah, there was a certain kind of sound he was going for. And it was basically kind of a dynamic choice that he made for his solos. He would start off quiet and then get loud. Or he would start off kind of a loud or a medium volume with the sticks and then go into a lower dynamic, lower volume with his hands and do all kinds of... He would even use his fingers and just kind of, you know, on the drums. And you can hear that in the recording. It was kind of a way to give his solos kind of a ebb and flow. A little bit more character and presence than just playing them the same kind of way at the same volume, yeah. just doing different stuff. Instead, he's like, okay, I'm going exactly. to go high, low. We're going to give different the, sounds for you know each mm. instrument. We're going to do... Yeah, it's pretty interesting how they play with dynamics. That's, that's really what makes a good solo, especially a good drum solo, because there's only so much you can do with the drums, but the best solos, the best players, will often incorporate dynamics and kind of a melodic rhythms to really give the solo a real musical feel. And that's why the Moby Dick solo is great. Now, the last <laughs> song on the album. Bring It On Home. Is my personal favorite song on this it album. It brings it home. This is the third blues staple. It was kind of <laughs> plagiarized by Zeppelin. A whole lot of love and Bring It On Home. There, there was a bit of controversy with these songs that 
Willie Dixon eventually brought them to court and they had to settle. Credit him as the writer on the album. Either way, it's still a great song and a great homage to Willie and a lot of the blues acts. And it starts off as just just Jimmy on the guitar and Robert on vocals with the harmonica. And it, they're just playing a straight, slow blues. And it's so groovy. Very Western feeling almost. And then, you know, he comes in with like the, you know, the vocal effects on his voice. And you almost can't really understand him. And it's like really bluesy, but it's also kind of a little bit like, like mysterious. And then it just explodes with a great, like, harmonized guitar riff. Thunderous drums, like very loud drums by Bonham. And then it gets into that typical Zeppelin feel. And then the song eventually ends back with the same harmonica blues format as it started with. But I love the little ending lick, that little boom, doom, 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 boom. You know, a lot of that version of that lick. It all flows together so well. It's almost like very easy to predict where, where it'll go next, but it doesn't make it any less satisfying to me. It's certainly a love letter to the old Roots blues music. A song that was originally performed by Sonny Boy Williamson the second Zeppelin just kind of took that arrangement and made it their own. Going back a little bit, we kind of praise a lot of the instruments on this album, but I feel like Plant's actual vocals are stronger than his writing on this album. Because I feel like there's a lot of points where he uses his voice as an instrument and it doesn't feel out of place. It feels like there is like another instrument, especially on songs like Whole Lot of Love and Bring It On Home. And even when he's not really you know saying words, he's feeling in that space and his vocals are kind of soaring all over the mix. And it sounds really good sonically. Indeed. And a lot of that should be credited to Jimmy Page himself as he was the producer and the legendary sound engineer, Eddie Kramer who has worked with everyone. So it's those two guys are a big part of the sound of this album and the sound of hard rock. Jimmy Page and Eddie Kramer, thank you. Well, with that being said, do you guys have anything you want to say before we get into our final thoughts? I guess I'll go ahead and start. So what can be said about Led Zeppelin that hasn't already been said? I mean, these guys were trailblazers, innovators, master musicians, the imprint that they left historically on not only rock music, but music in general is almost unmatched. You could make an argument for over half their catalog being essential albums. I do think Led Zeppelin II is an essential rock album. You know, despite my feelings about some of the writing and a song here or there, this is a quintessential rock listen. If you want to understand rock, if you want to appreciate rock, Led Zeppelin II should be on your listening list. Go listen to this album. If you love rock music, you won't regret it. So Matt kind of explained why it was an essential, but here's why I think you should listen to it. It's, in a, it's a perfect crossroads between two genres of music that makes it a perfect entry point to both of those. Hard Rock, I would say that Led Zeppelin II is a perfect intro to Hard Rock. And it's also a perfect intro to start if you want to start scaling back into like the old blues. Like a perfect point to start. It's kind of like Hard Rock and Blues Rock for dummies, essentially. The instrumentals on this album are borderline flawless as far as Hard Rock goes. Everything is in its right place. The musicians are all at their peak. Every lick is good. Every guitar part is good. There's not a part in any of these songs that feels like that you're going to be like falling asleep or like, oh, I wish I'd go to the next track. Or There's none of that. All these instrumentalists, all these band members are doing the most, and they're going to keep you on the edge of your seat. They're going to keep you paying attention throughout the whole thing. It's one of the best blues rock albums of all time. Also one of the best hard rock albums of all time. And that's why it's essential. That's why you should listen to it all the way through if you haven't already. A lot of you will probably have heard a lot of the, the common songs, but I think the deep cuts have equal merit. They are the band that got me into listening to music and really what made me want to be a musician. Zeppelin is one of, is the band that made me fall in love with listening to music and made me want to be a musician. 
like I was saying earlier, watching Dad's Led Zeppelin DVD box set with all those Zeppelin live performances. It was essentially a compilation of all these performances, like Royal Albert Hall and Song Remains the Same, the Madison Square Garden show, Nebworth and 77. Watching those, I, I just remember being mesmerized. How could he be making these sounds? I remember trying to learn the beat to Black Dog. I'm trying to learn all these Bonham beats and licks and all the stuff that he was playing, and this is what really got me into playing drums and appreciating music on a deep level more than anything. And Led Zeppelin II is really kind of the album that centered my love for rock music and blues rock and hard rock. It was the beginning of everything, and it's the reason why I still love the old music to this day. This album is, without a doubt, an essential for not only someone who wants to listen to rock or wants to listen to blues or funk or anything. It is an essential listen for a lover of music. 10 out of 10, Led Zeppelin II. Go listen to it. But with that being said, any final thoughts, guys? Alrighty, well, this is Off the Key Essentials, and we're out of here. Thanks, guys. I just wanted to give a shout out to Lacrembo for the intro and outro music. Also, check out our link tree for where to follow us. We are on Instagram and Facebook and a variety of streaming platforms. And if you could give us a sub or a listen or even a follow, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thanks, guys. See you later.